Okay. So uh, thank you, Rishab and Noah for giving me this opportunity to speak. Uh, and I'm very excited to present this work. The title of my work is Indistinguishability Obfuscation from Simple to State Hard Problems, New Assumptions, Techniques, and Simplification. And this is joint work with Romain, uh, Rachel, and Amit. So let me start off by uh, defining formally what indistinguishability obfuscation is. Uh, it's just a polynomial time compiler that takes in a circuit C and outputs uh, an equivalent version of the same circuit C. And further, it also has an added security feature associated with it. The security feature is that if you start with two circuits which compute the same function, meaning that it can have different implementation, but otherwise it has same input output behavior. And if it has the same uh, size, then once you obfuscate those circuits, what you get at the end uh, are computationally hard to distinguish. And this uh, seemingly simple definition uh, has turned out to have profound applications in all of cryptography. In fact, uh, like these are just few applications just that I have managed to write down in a piece of slide. Um, and so much so that it is now hailed as one of the um, like uh, almost a crypto uh, complete primitive uh, by the community. And uh, so much so that even that in the first instinct that every hard problem has just become to throw obfuscation at, uh, at the problem. So for the rest of my talk, uh, I'm going to follow roughly the following outline. First, I will give you a brief survey of uh, what are the constructions that are known in this uh, for, for obfuscation and what are the assumptions that they make. And then I'm going to uh, give our, uh, describe our main contribution, which is a new assumption. And uh, after that, I will uh, lay down a roadmap, which will mainly describe how we uh, construct obfuscation based on that new assumption. And also I will uh, describe what are the technical uh, novelties and what are the te main technical contributions of our work. And after that, I will talk about in detail um, some cryptanalysis that we did on these, uh, these new assumptions and also uh, what are uh, some of um, the main uh, PRG construction contributions of our work. And um, uh, so it turns out that we, in this work, propose some new PRG construction, which have some really nice properties. So I will describe that. And at the end, if I get time, I will talk about um, uh, some uh, new leakage resilience lemma that we provide in this paper, mainly to give you a flavor of what kind of techniques uh, that are going to construct in this work. Okay, so let me now start off uh, with a landscape of IO construction. So, so far all uh, known IO construction typically fit uh, one or a, uh, one of the following main three, four categories, which I have listed down here. So the first set of construction came through this uh, object uh, known as multilinear maps. In fact, the first breakthrough work of uh, Gerg, Gentry, Halevi, Rekovasa and Waters um, gave a construction of obfuscation based uh, on a very direct manner. They started with this branching program or, uh, or uh, they started with a simple branching program and then suitably encoded it using multilinear map encodings. And that was the first IO candidate. Uh, later, this paradigm was followed by a bunch of other works. In fact, very recently till uh, 2018. Uh, then the first attempt at isolating a single simple assumption that is instance independent uh, and an assumption based on multilinear maps came through the work of GLSW14. Uh, after that, it was followed up extensively and um, then um, uh, there was a lot of progress and we saw uh, at least five constructions where uh, they proposed um, obfuscation constructions based on uh, simple instance independent assumptions on uh, constant degree multilinear maps. Unfortunately, however, um, as of now, we do not know of any single uh, construction that has managed to give us a simple secure instantiation of those assumptions. And uh, as you all know, the main reason behind it is that uh, these constructions have been subject to a lot of uh, cryptanalysis over past few years, and there have been cycles of attacks and fixes. And then what ends up happening is that these assumptions uh, for a simple secure construction, uh, uh, for, a sing for a secure construction end up being quite complicated. Then uh, they were uh, recently we have been seeing some other constructions which construct obfuscation directly, just like GJHRSW, but now they do not uh, uh, use multilinear maps anymore. In fact, they work with some new kind of mathematics in order to achieve that. So we have seen a couple of works uh, recently 
uh, about uh, about those ways. Um, then there is another way of uh, constructing obfuscation, which has recently been emerging. In in those works, we typically uh, come up with frameworks which are um, simpler than I/O, which look appear simpler than I/O, and then uh, we show that those frameworks imply obfuscation, and then uh, we propose candidate construction for those frameworks. So one such construction was that of noisy linear FE, which is a framework. And uh, the work of Agarwal in 2019 showed that this noisy, noisy linear FE is enough to imply obfuscation. And then uh, in that work and in a follow-up work recently in 2020, um, candidate construction of noisy linear FE was proposed, relying on security of uh, some n true style encodings. And very, very recently, in, even in fact, in last year clip, uh, there's this no, new uh, notion of split FHE, which I find particularly exciting, where uh, they, where they uh, propose this notion of split FHE, and then uh, they showed that this implies I.O. And um, they were able to give candidate construction of the split FHE based on um, damgard juric uh, encryption and fully homomorphic encryption. Uh, in fact, you heard a talk about this only last week and in the same seminar. But unfortunately, however, uh, these two works uh, also do not yield simple assumptions. In fact, the assumptions, when you write it down, uh, they end up looking quite complicated. So in this work, I'm going to talk about constructing IO from simple to state assumptions. So let me clarify what I mean by simple to state. Uh, I mean that these assumptions uh, on which we want to construct IO should be instance independent, succinct, and uh, falsifiable. So in this work, uh, I'm going to follow up mainly on the work of AGLMS and GLMS, uh, both of which appeared in 2019. And uh, at this point, let me remark uh, that there's another work of Agarwal, which also gave a construction uh, of indistinguishability obfuscation from uh, a simple to state assumption uh, that can be instantiated either uh, using the, um, uh, the assumption given in AGLMS 19 or via a degree two pseudo randomness assumption uh, for which we do not know of any secure instantiation as of now. Uh, and uh, we will not follow up on that work. So uh, today let, I'll just follow up on JLMS. So um, let me now give you the state of our theorem statement that appeared in the work of JLMS 19. Uh, the theorem said that you can construct sublinearly efficient secret key functional encryption from a, a sub-exponential time hardness of following assumptions. The assumptions are uh, SXTH assumption over bilinear maps, the learning with error assumption, uh, Boolean PRGs over, uh, NC, for NC0 with polynomial stretch, and uh, a new notion, which is called as perturbation resilient generator, also abbreviated as delta RG. Okay, so now I want to remark a few things about this definition. First, uh, that in this work, they use uh, sub-exponential time hardness of the following assumptions. The first three assumptions, SXTH, LW, Boolean, PRGs, they have been out there for a long time and they are considered uh, standard. The last assumption is, the, is uh, really the new assumption. So uh, we are going to, for the rest of the talk, focus on this uh, new notion of delta RG and uh, understand our work with, this, with com uh, comparisons to uh, this assumption of delta RG. And now, once you have uh, I, uh, once you have this sub-exponentially uh, secure secret key function encryption, then you can use a known set of transformation, in fact, a sequence of transformations, which are outlined in the work of uh, BV, AJ, BNPW, and KNT to obtain I.O. Uh, does anyone have any questions till this point? Okay, so I'll proceed. Now, um, in order to understand our work, um, um, first let us try to understand the assumption that was laid on JLMS in a bit more detail. So we're going to look at uh, the structure of the assumption on a high level. On a high level, uh, roughly, uh, the assumption um, um, has the following structure. It has two, uh, it has instance of the following form. So it has uh, two components. The instance has two components. The first component uh, are some set of polynomials. Uh, they are n to the 1.1 polynomials with n inputs, okay? So um, n inputs, n to the 1.1 polynomials, where each polynomial um, are, have integer coefficients, 
So they are from Zx1 to Zxn and they have constant degree. Okay, and these inputs, even through En, they are sampled from integers from a random domain of, uh, at random from some domain minus b comma b. So these are your polynomials. But along with that, the assumption also gives some leakages on these errors, on these inputs, even through En. So namely, uh, in the assumption, there were also some LW samples which looked like this. You had uh, LW samples which used errors EI which uh, appeared in, as inputs to the polynomial. So roughly that was the structure of the GLMS assumption. Now, um, this is great. Uh, so, but I would like to point out that there are uh, some nice properties and then there are some not so nice properties of this assumption. And uh, interestingly, what turns out is that both nice and not nice aspects are the same. Namely, uh, this uh, assumption and the style of uh, uh, um, the, the style of assumption and uh, this area is, has been new and evolving. So let, let's look at the positive aspect first. Uh, the first aspect is that this assumption is simple to state. So this is great. And uh, what's also interesting is that it differs from most traditional crypto, which is done over ZP or like finite groups or uh, F2 and things like that. Uh, second nice thing about it is that uh, historically speaking, polynomials have been around for a long, long time. And in fact, uh, if you consider a problem of finding roots, that's actually NP-hard. Uh, so this uh, sort of provides some anecdotal, suggestive uh, plausibility that these assumptions might have some inherent hardness in them. Okay, so this is only uh, suggestive. Um, and the third nice property uh, is that uh, this is uh, a great reason to study average case polynomial inversion problems because just because this problem has uh, huge implications in cryptography. Uh, let's now see some of the not so nice aspects. The, the main uh, complaint or the main not so nice aspect is that this is only proposed recently in 2018. So it has not been around for a long time. And therefore we do not have a, a huge body of cryptanalysis to back confidence in this work. In fact, uh, as I was telling you earlier, since uh, this is different from traditional crypto, which is done over finite groups uh, or ZP and things like that, there's, a, uh, there's an attack landscape that is traditionally not considered uh, that much in cryptography, mainly the attacks that arise from uh, continuous optimization algorithms and statistical methods of the, uh, over the years. So only time can tell what uh, this assumption, how this assumption pans out with respect to uh, these new uh, unventured avenues um, in, considered, uh, in cryptography. So um, that's one of the main downsides. So the main question, main question that we consider in this work is that can we replace these um, integer polynomials with something that has have a long history of study and that has had a long body of cryptanalysis uh, so that we can tout security just based on, uh, on those things. And uh, in particular, a more specific question is, can you replace it with Boolean PRGs that have been around for a long time uh, with us? So in fact, that is what we do in this work. Uh, we are going to propose a new assumption. Uh, and our, our assumption actually uh, relies on interaction between two uh, assumptions that have been around much before uh, our work. So the first assumption is learning with error with uh, learning with error with binary noise LBE, and the second assumption is uh, pseudo random generators in NC zero with some sufficient stretch, which I will just quantify. Okay. Um, now uh, let me now go over uh, these problems and just give you a brief overview of what they are. Now learning with error uh, with binary uh, noise, uh, it's just like LWE where the error distribution is. Um, binary, meaning that you can, um, so let's say the error distribution can just be zero and one, and you are going to sample uh, LW errors from that. Now for that, um, turns out this problem is provably hard when uh, the number of samples that you give is linear in the dimension. So this was uh, proven by Michenchu and Pikert, um, where they proved, uh, they actually gave a, a reduction from a worst case hard lattice problem. Um, to the setting when there are LW samples with binary noise, uh, which are the number of them are linear in the dimension. Of course, the modulus has uh, chosen some specific parameters, which I will not go, uh, which will, I will not talk about right now. 
then when you have the number of samples which is quadratic in the dimension then this uh, LWE with binary noise is actually polynomial time broken and it's a very simple and elegant uh, linearization attack which was given in Aurora and Guy in 2011. Um, as I'm, uh, so actually we work uh, in a regime which is between uh, linear and n square. Um, it would have been nice if you could work with just linear samples but we can't. So actually we work within a regime when the number of uh, uh, output bits, uh, number of samples that's, uh, that grows like n to the 2 minus epsilon, where epsilon is some constant greater than 0. And under uh, that uh, circumstances, it turns out the best known algorithm for uh, a choice of parameters which we use is uh, 2 to the n to the epsilon. And these are algebraic algorithms uh, relying on Grobner basis approach. Uh, and uh, you can find uh, this in the following references. So there's a work of Albrecht et al. in 2015, and there's a work of Chow et al. in 19. Now let me talk about PRGs and NC0 sufficient stretch. So this, as you all know, has had a long history of study ever since the work of Goldreich in 2000. And um, best known attacks so far we know till date um, are sub-exponential even when the number of output bits, num the stretch of the PRG is as large as n to the d over 2 minus epsilon, where d is uh, a measure of degree of the PRG, which is called as the multilinear degree. And I will specify what this is in just a minute. Um, and there's a huge body of work supporting this. And uh, uh, we, however, will, yeah, we will also use uh, a stretch which is lesser than this uh, n to the d over 2 minus epsilon, so that's nice. Uh, and our assumption will avoid all known attacks in these, uh, all known sub-exponential time attacks known in this literature, and also some more attacks that we consider, which I will talk about in, later in the talk. Okay, so now uh, let me tell you formally our assumption, but before I do that, let me formally describe what LW with binary noise and PRGs, um, like syntactics of those things. So let's uh, recall LW with binary noise. So it, it's indexed with two parameters, epsilon and rho. Think of, uh, so they are constants, epsilon and rho are both constants. And think of uh, the modulus p as being lesser than two to the n to the, rho, n to the rho. So basically rho is just telling what the modulus is. And then uh, this assumption talks about indistinguishability of two distributions. Uh, in distribution D1, you are given LW samples which are uh, uh, generated like AI, AIS plus EI. So they are N LW samples. And uh, they, are, they are from, uh, so the dimension of the coefficient vectors and the secret is uh, n to the 0.5 plus epsilon. Uh, okay, so that's the dimension. Uh, and the errors are chosen from the Boolean distribution 0, 1. So that's distribution D1. Distribution D2 uh, just consists of coefficient vectors AI. Along with that, you have uniformly chosen RIs from ZP. And all you're asking is that these two distributions are uh, indistinguishable in standard sense against polynomial time algorithms. So that's LWBE. Uh, now let me quickly define what PR, Boolean PRGs are. I'm sure all of you know this, but uh, let me spend just a few seconds on that. So Boolean PRGs, they are um, low complexity functions that stretch. Are you uh, sure? Uh, yeah. Uh, was the 0.5 important in the definition of the assumption on the previous slide? What was the significance of 0.5? 0.5. Oh yeah. Okay. So the, thanks for asking me that. Uh, so number of samples is n, right? Yeah. Number of samples. Uh, and uh, dimension is n to the 0.5 plus epsilon. So that means uh, the number of samples is a dimension to the power 0.5 minus some. Uh, sorry, dim uh, dimension uh, to two minus some epsilon prime, because. I mean, the square of this is greater than n. Square of this is greater than n. Does it make okay. sense? Yeah, thank and you. Yeah. Because binary, as I told you before, binary LW is insecure when mm -hmm. you are, yeah, the number of samples is squared in the dimension. That's the only, only reason, yeah. It's just, uh, yeah, we, we could have worked with uh, this being n and that being uh, slightly more complicated, but turns out that this is uh, easier in, large, in the view of larger a definition, like the definition of our assumption, this notation is simpler. Okay. So uh, as I was saying, Boolean PRGs, um, they are length expanding low complexity objects. So uh, they take n bits of inputs and output m bits. 
where m is uh, some polynomial in n, and I will describe exactly what stretch we are working with. Um, and it ha they have low complexity, meaning that uh, so you can consider various notions of complexity, such, such as sometimes you might want uh, PRGs to have low depth as Boolean circuits, or low degree, or low locality. Uh, I will exactly describe what complexity measure we are working with. And security notion, as you all know, uh, is that when you apply the PRG on a random uh, input, that looks indistinguishable to a truly random string of length m to any computationally bounded adversary A. Okay, so as I was saying, uh, we use this complexity measure. So let me now define uh, what complexity measure we are using. We are going to use multilinear degree. Informally, we will also call this to be degree of the PRG over the years. So let's see what it is. Um, so let's say uh, you have an input x from 0, 1 to the n. You compute y1 through ym as an output of the PRG. Uh, now I'm going to define g and i as a function that computes the ith bit of the output. So it's a Boolean function, but uh, you can also write it as a polynomial over the reals. It's, you can write it on, in fact, as a multilinear polynomial. And this multilinear polynomial is going to be unique, okay? And uh, we're going to define di as the degree of this polynomial over the years. Uh, and simply the multilinear degree of the PRG is the maximum of all degrees from i in one to m. Now, uh, just for the sake of clarity, let me define one way in which you can write this multilinear polynomials. So, you, uh, so if, you have a, um, uh, if you have a circuit like that, you can, uh, you can replace gate by gate each uh, gate with a polynomial. So suppose you encountered x1, x or x2, you can replace it with this polynomial. Suppose you encountered x1 uh, and x2, you can just replace it with a multiplication. And finally, uh, as everything is a bo as Boolean, as every variable is Boolean, uh, simply xi squared is xi. Okay. So uh, this allows you to write multilinear polynomials. And in fact, I worked out an example uh, like this. So uh, if you want, I can stop here at the moment, but it's really uh, uh, something that you could figure out uh, offline and it's really simple. Okay, so uh, now we have uh, seen the definitions of binary LLUI and PRG, so we are now ready with our main assumption. Our main assumption is actually really simple uh, and it, it borrows parameters epsilon and rho from binary LLUI and it gets a uh, parameter G and it's degree for uh, the multilinear degree from the PRG assumption. And now um, uh, it's an indistinguishability of two distributions. In the first distribution, you have binary LW samples, AI, AIS plus EI, where EIs are chosen from zero one. There are NLW samples with dimension n to the 0.5 plus epsilon. The modulus was chosen according uh, less to be less than n to the rho, as I've described before. Um, along with that, you are going to give out PRG evaluation on the input uh, error vector, on the error vector. Basically, uh, PRG is simply applied on E1 to EN. Now this PRG has degree D, but we require this PRG to have a stretch of this N to the ceiling of D by two times 0.5 plus epsilon plus rho. So this might sound a little complicated, but roughly what we are asking is that the stretch should be more than N to the degree over two times 0.5 plus some any any constant and once you have a stretch more than this then you can backtrace epsilon and rho and instantiate or your assumption so this is a, a number to keep in mind n to the d over 2 the ceiling times 0.5 and when d is even then just translate that it's just n to the degree over 4 okay so our assumption states that this distribution that i was telling ai ais plus ei along with the prg outputs look indistinguishable in standard sense from uh, another distribution, D2, which consists of LW samples again. But now, instead of PRG output, you have truly random string of length n. And that's it, that's our assumption. Okay, and you're asking standard indistinguishability against all polynomial time adversaries with the uh, negligible advantage. So I hope the assumption is clear. Uh, if anyone has any questions, uh, please let me know. Okay, so uh, let me now uh, uh, state our main result. So we proved that if you are willing to assume standard polynomial hardness of the following assumptions, LWE, uh, standard assumptions over bilinear maps, S6DH and bilateral DLIN, 
Um, along with that, if you assume this assumption that I just described, G L W E D, then you can construct a public key sublinearly efficient functional encryption scheme directly from these three. Okay, so I now I want to stress uh, a few points and uh, like just to compare it with the JLMS assumption. First, we are only making use of polynomial hardness to construct FE. We are no longer requiring sub-exponential time hardness, which is non-standard. And then we directly construct public key FE instead of secret key FE. So these are the, one of the two high level main differences. And then once you have this, uh, then you can bootstrap it to IO using uh, this transformation of Vitensky and Vaikunathan and Anand and Jain. Okay. So just uh, let's do some final comparison with JLMS assumption. So I'm going to write, uh, uh, so this is our, uh, our assumption on the left. On the right, we have the JLMS assumption. So let me quickly recall what JLMS assumption was, like in just rough detail. There, uh, you had the same overall structure. There were LW samples, and then there was a leakage, uh, which was a polynomial evaluation on the, er on the errors. The errors were chosen from um, a wider domain, like let's say minus n to n. And uh, uh, in the second distribution, you had the LW samples, but now instead of the polynomial evaluation, you had polynomial evaluations perturbed with some small value delta j, which was uh, chosen adversarially by the adversary, and they had to be with some boundary integers. And we were asking, uh, we were asking that these two distributions for any sub for some sub exponential size adversary is weakly indistinguishable. Okay. So now, once we have this uh, thing, we can just compare our assumptions. So first, uh, I would say a positive aspect of our assumption is that we are using PRGs. So now we have some cryptanalysis to back this up. Um, second plus point is that now we work with only polynomial size adversaries. So that's also good. Um, the third plus point, which I feel is that uh, we are using negligible advantage instead of 0.99, which uh, really helps us in getting rid of the security amplification step and uh, our constructions become much more cleaner and direct and also gives us better quality assumptions. And one of mo uh, and, and then one of the, uh, there's one more plus point, which is very nice, is that our assumption is no longer interactive. So remember in the JLMS assumption, these deltas were chosen by the adversary. So now there is this completely non-interactive assumption. And, um, uh, and that's about it for the plus points. Uh, but I also feel that there are some negative points and let me state that. The main negative point is that we are using error to be uh, Boolean uh, as opposed to uh, standard n minus n to the n, and uh, this might make the LW part slightly insecure. Uh, so that is roughly this some sort of comparison that I wanted to do. So now let me um, describe the roadmap of the construction and how we can get this result. So we uh, actually, before I tell you the roadmap, I need to define a few notion, mainly the notion of partially hiding functional encryption. Um, so what partially hiding functional encryption is, it's just a generalization of a normal regular functional encryption uh, where you also have four algorithms. So let me go over them one by one. So there's a setup algorithm which is, uh, serves the same purpose. Uh, then there's an encryption algorithm, but now uh, as opposed to just taking one input, the encryption algorithm will take two inputs, X and Y. And then it produces a ciphertext that's like normal FE, but also, it just completely reveals the X part of the input. So uh, roughly intuitively, we are not asking the uh, scheme to, to um, uh, hide the X part of the input. And therefore, we will call X the public part and Y the private part of the message. The key gen is the same. Uh, it takes a circuit and master secret key and output a secret key for circuit C. And then you can uh, decrypt using this decryption algorithm to learn C of X comma Y. So you are learned joint in joint functions of the input. So it also has some efficiency properties, uh, which are traditionally considered in FA, FA literature. And I'm going to discuss only one notion of efficiency that is generally useful in, in if you want to construct IO, that's the notion of sublinearity. So what sublinearity says is that the size of the ciphertext is uh, only sublinear in the number of function queries that the adversary gets to make, okay? Uh, so that's sublinearity, and as we all know, that sublinear functional encryption implies I/O under some exponential laws from uh, from very nice works. Therefore, this is a really important efficiency definition. Finally, uh, let me also talk about security for one minute. Uh, so we are not going to 
uh, where in, the, in, in this talk, I'm not going to give you a proof of security. Therefore, let me just say it on a high level. Roughly, uh, the security requirement will just say something like that the only thing that's revealed to the adversary consists of the public part of the ciphertext along with the function outputs uh, C evaluated and X and Y for any queries circuit uh, or any queries of circuit that the adversary makes. So that's security. Um, and um, so this was PHFE, which, uh, which is, a, uh, as I was saying, was the generalization of FE. So let me show you why it cap the definition captures standard FE. And the reason is that you can simply set X to the public part to be bought. And if your circuit C is an arbitrary polynomial, polynomial size circuits, then, uh, then this captures FE trivially. And then under sub-exponential laws, you can con construct IO from that. Uh, the one of the more other notion that has been emerging, uh, the other notion of uh, functionality that has been emerging is f comma two PHFE, um, where f is denotes some function cl class that you can evaluate on the public part, and two denotes the degree uh, of uh, the um, the function in the private part of the input. So more precisely, uh, the function looks like following. Uh, we'll have the following structure. So C of X, Y is summation I, J, F, I, J, X. So F, I, J is in, in this class F, and then um, it gets multiplied with F, Y, I, Y, J. So this is degree two in Y. And this, uh, this is summed up over all indices I and J, and this computation is done modulo P, where P is some modulus that is fixed in the scheme, okay? And uh, this is a really useful primitive in order to construct IO, and JLMS 19 showed how to construct this, where F was a, constant degree polynomials over ZP. So they could construct a PHFE where for any class F, which was a constant degree polynomial over ZP, and uh, they constructed a secret variant, a secret key variant of that from bilinear maps. Uh, in this work, we in fact extend their result. We construct a public key variant instead of a secret key variant. But this F now can be any uh, arbitrary polynomially sized arithmetic branching program. And in fact, it will cover arithmetic NC1. So it's even more expressive in terms of functionality. Note that I want to stress that this public key variant is, uh, is, is essential, that it, this is the thing that helps us in order to construct public key FE directly. Okay, so now once you have this definition, the roadmap, uh, let's recall the roadmap of JLMS. And it might already appear to you that it is pretty, pretty complex and complicated. So uh, there, uh, they started with uh, this secret key NC0 comma 2 FPHFE, where the public part was constant uh, depth circuits. Um, and then uh, they used it with FHE schemes and this uh, new assumption that they make, delta RG, to construct a weakly secure uh, sublinear secret key FE for constant depth Boolean circuits. Um, and then they did another bootstrapping by using PRGs and NC0 uh, to construct sublinear secret key FE for circuits with uh, weak security. And then after that, uh, they did security amplification by relying on LWE. And under, the, under this, uh, they had to go through a, a sub exponential size loss in the assumption. Basically, that uh, size of the adversary uh, had to blow up by uh, sub exponential factor in, in the reduction. And then they, uh, once you have sublinear secret key FE, which is fully secure, then uh, you can use this transformation of BNPW to construct XIO. And then uh, you can use uh, uh, a scheme of GKPVZ, which is a succinct FE scheme instantiated from LWE to get public key FE uh, with this BNPW16 transformation. So that's how you construct public key FE. And then from there, you can do sub-exponential, uh, under sub-exponential laws, you can apply the transformations of BB and AJ to get IO. Note that there is another transformation that you could, uh, could use to directly get to IO from sub, uh, sub-linear secret key FE, uh, which is that of KNT, which first construct an unbounded secret key FE, and uh, meaning that it can allow any number of function key queries. And then from there, uh, under sub-exponential advantage laws, you can apply another transformation of KNT to get to IO. But I would like to point that this uh, transformation is at least as more complicated than uh, the BNPW transformation. And in, uh, 
and uh, therefore it's not clear that it is any more direct. So uh, this is our roadmap, and as you can already see, this is a lot of simplification, and uh, we have a lot of blocks which are which were not there in the previous slide. There, uh, the bootstrapping steps and the amplification steps are completely out of the picture now. So let me uh, describe what our transformation does. So first, it constructs uh, this public key NC1 comma 2 PHFE. As I was saying, that uh, it, you can have arithmetic branching programs in the public component and degree two in the private component. So this we build from standard by linear maps. Um, and then uh, you, we construct another primitive, a uh, single ciphertext secret key function encryption with linear key generation. So here, the key generation step is linear in the secret key. Uh, and then we use our new assumption to build a uh, public key FE. Now, I, I want to remark something here. Uh, uh, the first three things that I just wrote down, the ingredients, they are actually spiritually Functionality wise, the, the purpose that serve is quite similar to what uh, uh, to these objects. In fact, this delta RG is a pseudo randomness assumption. We have a GW LW leak, which is also a pseudo randomness assumption. And here we were using FHG to achieve exp an expressive functionality, and we are using going to use this to have more expressive functionality. And in fact, if you look at our construction here, you will see some, uh, uh, it will be reminiscent of uh, some special purpose FHG. Uh, another point I want to make is that this public ENC1 comma 2 FH PHFE is, uh, is used to provide enforcement and this is what was the purpose of uh, secret key NC02 comma PHFE also. But still our transformation is much more direct and the main re one of the main reasons uh, behind this is that uh, we are going to provide a new leakage resilience lemma, um, which let me write down, new leakage resilience lemma. Uh, which uh, is actually one of the cornerstones of our paper. And this is something, it's a new proof technique that allows us to actually just use them and uh, directly construct P PKFE with only polynomial loss in the size and the advantage. In fact, there are no parallel repetitions anymore and, um, and it get, completely obviates the need of any security amplification or even any bootstrapping. And finally, once you have this public KFE, you can just apply the transformation of AJ and VV to get IO. Okay. Ayush, uh, yeah, I have a quick question. So, uh, so if you replace this new public key PHFE that you constructed in this work, in the previous uh, picture, in the JLMS yeah. picture, yeah. then does it simplify the JLMS picture as well, or it does not? If I just no, it does not. You still need to do this step. You still need to do this step. Like uh, you, what you because this is a weaker assumption, right? This, so it has I a weak see. advantage like that. So uh, this kind of propagates downwards. But what if we have uh, delta RGs with the uh, better advantage? Like technically, that, you uh, that, we, that we did not know how to construct mainly because uh, um, because uh, uh, okay. So the way let me uh, back it up. Okay. So this was our assumption. So remember, this is polynomially bounded, right? These deltas are also polynomially bounded. So how can you have something negligible here? Because I mean, it's going to reveal something about delta with some advantage, right? Yeah, okay, that makes sense, thank you. So that was the main reason. And here, it, it, the, the proof technique um, that we do is like, we're not going to, uh, we're not going to, uh, there will be something which is uh, significantly different from JLMS, which allows us to do that. I mean, basically, uh, first of all, our assumption only gives negligible advantage. And even after that, we need to take care of this issue, that meaning that delta can be revealed out of this. So this is done by some new leakage resilience technique, this part. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So this is our uh, comparison. And as I've uh, described our contribution, so I will skip to the next slide. Mainly, uh, we construct uh, all these three things, uh, and we will give a new proof technique and a new proof. Okay. So now let me uh, jump to the uh, actually a significantly interesting part. Uh, we uh, this is about cryptanalysis and constructing new PRGs, which allows us to instantiate our assumption. So with this, I want to just recall the assumption first so that uh, we can keep a handle on that. Our assumption had, I just want to, you to remember that our assumption had two components, a PRG and LW samples. So uh, any attack that you can think of on these assumptions, uh, typically you can uh, break it in one of the following categories. 
you can think of them as attacks on the PRG component alone. You can think of them as being attacks on uh, binary DLW component alone. And then there are attacks that make use of the joint structure and the joint relation between uh, these two objects. So these are the attacks on the joint assumption. So uh, let me now re recap some of the main known attacks that exist out there for all these three categories. So for uh, binary LW, uh, typically uh, in literature, the most common attacks are the lattice reduction attacks where you use LLL or BKZ kind of uh, algorithms to uh, mount attacks. Then there are these algebraic attacks wherein you write down some mathematical equation capturing like booleanity constraints and uh, so on and so forth and do algebraic manipulation until an inverse or a refutation is found. So that's algebraic attacks. Um, and then there are attacks on PRGs. And uh, for PRGs, actually the literature is really uh, systematic and organized. Uh, we have as a community um, uh, been able to, we have been successful to actually identify three main kinds of attacks. And if uh, your PRG is guaranteed to be secure against those attacks, then it's generally considered a really solid evidence that the PRG is secure. So those attacks are F2 linear bias attacks. So where what you do is that you take linear combinations of the PRG outputs and try to construct something that does not behave like a random function, meaning that in expectation, it does not uh, have expectation of half. It can either like, it doesn't ha have a 50% probability of both zero and one. So that's F2 linear bias attacks. Then there is another um, attacks that actually is coming from sum of squares paradigm. So just to recall, sum of squares uh, is a really powerful hierarchy that's built on uh, of com convex optimization that is built on semi-definite programs. And in fact, it provides uh, the front runner of our algorithms for constraint satisfaction problems. And it, it provides the best known approximation algorithms for many of the NP hard problems that exist out there. So it's a really powerful technique. And then uh, there are algebraic attacks here also, wherein you use these uh, uh, mathematical equations that you have and try to use that uh, to mount, do algebraic manipulations and mount algebraic attacks on that. Uh, and this can also be studied in conjunction with what is known as guess and determine attacks, where you guess some bits and then do your algebraic uh, derivations and, and then see if your guess was correct and, or not and so on and so forth. So this is about PRG. Um, and then uh, I was talking about attacks on the joint assumption. Here, unfortunately, we just know of a single way of uh, doing mounting an attack. Um, that is um, by extending algebraic attacks. Mainly, you can exploit these equations which arise from both the, uh, both the components uh, using, um, by writing some equations over fin finite field FP and then do Grobner basis computation on that. And uh, it's really an interesting question if you can come up with any other attack that uh, that does not use that is not is not algebraic basically uh, the question is can you come up with more uh, attacks in this third category so that's that now let me uh, recap the attacks on line lw with binary noise so here um, as i've told you when the number of samples is linear then you are good uh, when you are uh, when uh, the number of samples is uh, square of the dimension, then it's broken in polynomial time due to the work of Rho and Guy. However, as I was saying, we work in intermediate regime. For us, epsilon is some constant between zero and 0.5. Uh, so for that, there are two main kinds of uh, attacks. Uh, one of them are lattice attacks, uh, where we um, uh, where we use uh, these lattice reductions to mount and um, like recover the secrets and uh, so on and so forth. So for that, um, the, the heuristic running time for BKZ algorithm is uh, this quantity, basically dimension divided by log P to the power dimension by log P. And this can be made to be sub-exponential if you set the modulus uh, such that rho is less than 0.5 plus epsilon, okay? So this, uh, uh, the reference for this is uh, a slide that I saw from Damien Stelling. Um, then uh, for algebraic attacks, uh, um, for algebraic attacks, the picture is uh, really nice. Um, it turns out that um, in, uh, in a sequence of works, nam namely by Albrecht et al. and then follow up uh, Chow et al., they established that the Grobner basis algorithms take uh, this much time, two to the n to the two epsilon, uh, where epsilon was this. Okay, so that's about algebraic attacks. Now uh, let me discuss some attacks on the PRG, but even before that, I need to tell you what candidates we have for PRG. 
So we are going to use Goldrack PRG, and uh, I'm sure all of you might know what Goldrack PRG is, but let me nevertheless quickly describe what it is. So Goldrack PRG uh, is indexed with two things, a hypergraph H and a predicate P. P is typically a constant local uh, predicate. It's a Boolean predicate. It takes L bits of input and outputs of, uh, in zero one. And now uh, this hypergraph will basically tell you how to evaluate the PRG. Uh, in this hypergraph, there'll be two sets of vertices. One set is this, the other set is that. Uh, in, in the first set, uh, there are nodes corresponding to the input. Okay, so there are n inputs, so there, uh, there'll be n nodes. And uh, the second set consists of nodes corresponding to the outputs. So there are m outputs, there are m nodes. Uh, now it's a bipartite graph. So every uh, node uh, in the output set is going to be connected with l input nodes, okay? So the degree of output node is l. And then this, this tells you how to evaluate the PRG. Basically, in order to evaluate the output bit, you will take the corresponding node and apply the predicate on the neighbors of uh, that uh, node, in neighbors here in the input node. So uh, that's what you do. And this way you can evaluate the PRG. And typically this hypergraph is chosen uh, to have high expansion properties, but you can uh, uh, make sure that this happens by sampling as randomly. So this tells you how to uh, evaluate the PRG. Now, typically, uh, we are working with multi-near degree, uh, and uh, this uh, uh, the PRG is L local, so you can obviously see that the degree is going to be less than L. Uh, that's because any degree L Boolean function can be written as a degree D polynomial, a degree L polynomial. So the degree has is less than or equal to L, and typically, what this PRG provides, they provide the stretch that looks like n to the omega of L, that means n to the some constant times L. Um, and uh, that's what we want to optimize here. Uh, this depends significantly on what predicates that you are choosing. So let's look at the, one of the predicates uh, that, uh, in fact, one of the first studied predicates, that is the predicate of TSA. Um, it stands for try sum and and. So it takes five bits of inputs and, uh, and then XORs the first three of them and then XORs it with product of last two. So that's it, that's TSA. And you can see that it has locality five. Uh, over F2, it has a degree of two because this is the only nonlinear path. Uh, when you write it down as a polynomial the, over the reals, it turns out it has a degree five. So uh, you don't get any benefit here. Um, and this is believed to be secure as, for against all sub exponential time algorithms as long as the number of output bits is less than n to the 1.5 minus epsilon where epsilon is some constant, any arbitrary constant, uh, you can choose it to be uh, as small as you want. And uh, really the evidence of, for this is uh, very well founded. Basically there are known F2 linear attacks lower bounds for um, uh, which were proven in the work of Oda, Nobel and Whitmer. And then uh, there are SOS lower bounds against uh, algorithms turning into the n to the epsilon time. This was also proven in Oda, Whitmer and, uh, and KMOW. Um, and then um, for algebraic attacks, actually, we do not have any lower bounds, but all known uh, algebraic attacks take some exponential time. Um, so that seems good. Uh, and the question is, can we use it to instantiate our assumption? And turns out the answer is no. And the reason for that is that the degree is five. And remember, we want uh, the stretch to be more than ceiling of uh, five by two times uh, 0.5. So this, uh, um, yeah, so this, this thing is three. So n to the three times 0. 0.5, which is n to the 1.5. And turns out with this stretch, uh, actually the predicate is broken. So you need uh, the stretch to be more than n to the 1.5 plus constant and you can't handle that. So we need to do something and uh, let's, for the next part of the talk, let's focus on how you can build a predicates which give us what we want and uh, how you can also make sure that they are not broken. So turns out for PRGs, there are really nice systematic study. And uh, it turns out that we have boiled down to just two parameters that suffice for parameterizing upper bounds, lower bounds, and the running times for all, uh, all of the three attacks nodes. So uh, these uh, were introduced, uh, I mean, they existed much before, but actually this kind of formal theorem statement appeared in the work of Applebaum and Lovett. So let me tell you what these parameters are. So first parameter of importance is k-wise independence. 
So what is k-wise independence? Uh, we say that a predicate p is k-wise independent if for um, any, uh, if you XOR that with any uh, set of variables corresponding to a set of size less than or equal to k minus one, uh, and you then you XOR with the predicate, then uh, this does not make the predicate unbalanced. N namely, we say that it's k-wise independent if XOR uh, of the variables i and s, uh, XOR with predicate um, takes probability with probability half over the inputs, it maps to zero, with probability half, it maps to one. So it's an expectation, this is half. So that's what k-wise independence means. Uh, is the definition clear? Okay. Another parameter of importance is rational degree. And uh, a rational degree is a degree over F2. Okay, so uh, what is rational degree? It's, it's just a minimum degree for which you can find out two degree E polynomials Q and R, such that when you multiply P with Q, you get R over F2 X and through X. So that's rational degree. Okay, let me repeat myself. Uh, rational degree is a degree E, uh, minimum degree E such that for which you can find two functions Q and R of degree E such that P times Q is R. Okay, so once these parameters are, are clear, then actually the uh, story is really, uh, I mean, I, actually I'm cheating a little bit in the sense that uh, you can work with more fine-grained aspects of fine-grained variants of rational degree to get more fine-grained trade-offs, but asymptotically they don't change uh, the story a whole lot. So therefore, for, uh, for simplicity, I will just work with these two parameters. So uh, for linear attacks, it turns out there are polynomial time attacks when uh, the stretch n to the s is greater than n to the k by two. So I'm going to denote the stretch with um, n to the s for, for these, this slide. And then there are theoretic, theoretical lower bounds when the uh, stretch is less than n to the minimum of uh, k comma e divided by 18. So uh, this is when you can prove lower bounds. This is another extreme. So we are in the middle, we do not have theoretical lower bounds uh, and we, um, there are no vulnerable time attacks. So it turns out the best known attacks are sub-exponential when, um, when the stretch uh, is less than minimum of k by two comma e minus, ep minus epsilon, where epsilon is any arbitrary small constant. Okay, uh, for SOS uh, attacks, turns out picture is really crisp and there is a tight characterization. So when the stretch is more than k by two, then there are polynomial time attacks. When the stretch uh, S is less than um, N to the K by two minus epsilon times uh, this constant K by two minus one, then provably the attacks runs into to the N to the epsilon time. And so there's a very sharp um, phase shift from K by two to K by two minus small. So that's SOS algorithms. For algebraic attacks, uh, there are uh, polynomial time attacks when N to the, the stretch is more than N to the E. Okay, and uh, there are provable lower bounds when S is less than E minus one over eight. So this was also proven in the work of KL16. And for this, the best known attacks are sub-exponential when uh, S is e min less than E minus epsilon. And this is, you can find these theorem statements in uh, a very nice work of uh, Koto et al. on concrete security of PRGs. Uh, so the main takeaway that I want to give is that it's easy to build predicates that resist all known sub exponential attacks when you set m to be less than minimum of k by 2 comma e minus epsilon so our goal is just to find out predicates which have high rational degree and high k wise independence how high rational degree it has to be greater than d by 4 how high k wise independence it has to be greater than d by 2 where d is the degree of your the uh, real degree of your predicate okay so that's the goal so let's now uh, let's now jump straight into it. Let's uh, just look at all the uh, predicates that exist out there and see if you can instantiate. So the first candidate that we can use is that of XOR majority. It's one of uh, it's considered one of the most uh, secure predicates out there. So it's 2L local uh, predicate. It takes 2L inputs. Okay, and then what it does, it XORs uh, the first L of them and then XORs it with the majority function applied on the remaining L. Okay, and for this, it turns out this is L plus one Y is independent. Why? Because uh, these are, um, L Y is independent comes from the fact that you are XORing L independent variables here. 
And then uh, since majority is balanced, it's a balanced function. Therefore, it provides one more degree of freedom. So it's L plus one. Uh, the Boolean uh, the real degree when you write it down as a polynomial turns out it's two to the two L and it's uh, it's actually um, I, I'll leave it as an exercise for you to verify. The third thing is the the, the rational degree uh, is actually L plus one over two. Now this is not something that that is easy to see, but um, uh, it's actually proven in the work of uh, C M zero one in um, uh, two thousand one where they proved that this is uh, the, the maximum possible uh, rational degree for any predicate. So it was L plus one by two. Uh, the maximum uh, stretch therefore you can get from this, from our intuition is N to the L plus one by two minus Delta. For this, what we require is N to the ceiling of D by two times 0.5 plus epsilon. It works out to be N to the L plus L by two plus epsilon. Now you can set epsilon and delta so that this quantity is greater than uh, that, and then you can use it to instantiate. But uh, this should already uh, seem like a very tight margin because uh, the maximum stretch is n to the l plus one by two, and required is n to the l by two, so there's not a room to play with. In order to address this issue, we actually consider uh, a very nice predicate that was proposed in the work of uh, um, Lombardi and Vaikunathan. Um, where they propose this uh, modification of the TSA predicate, which we did not try some parity and, and uh, TSPA. It is a five local predicate. So it exhorts the first three of them as uh, like a TSA predicate. Then it exhorts it uh, with uh, something else. So in TSA, you exhort it with X4 times X5. Now they are going to exhort it with X4 translated with X2, product with x5 translated with x3. So it's just TSA where these uh, last two variables are translated with some vari variables here. So that they are no longer independent. Uh, so for this, it turns out that it's three-wise independent. It's, uh, this is uh, somewhat non-trivial to see, but you can believe me on it and I'll also show you how, later how. The degree over the reals actually drops down to just three. It's no longer a degree five predicate. And this is a really, this was really a surprising observation at that point. And I will uh, also give you a for, formal proof in more generality than, than this. And finally, the rational degree is two, and it's in fact the same as TSA. The rational degree is preserved by this. Um, so therefore the maximum stretch you can hope for is n to the three by two minus delta. In fact, uh, the authors themselves uh, prove lower bounds for n to the 1.25 minus epsilon. Um, whereas the required stretch is just n to the one plus epsilon. So now you get a lot of room to play with the parameters. So what we do next is that we produce, uh, we give our own uh, degree halving uh, transformation, which it, uh, literally uh, reduces the degree by a factor of two, and it's inspired heavily from the lombardi vaikunathan predicate. So Suppose you had um, an original predicate which does X or G. Uh, so as an example here, uh, G was majority. Uh, it's a two L local predicate. Predicate. So this looked like this. Okay, you XOR uh, first uh, L of them and then XOR it with G applied on the remaining L. Our transformation, what it does is that it um, takes XOR of first L and then XORs it with G applied on a translated set of variables. So namely, instead of x uh, l plus i input here, you're going to replace it with x l plus i, x or x i. So it's translated with variables from here. So it, uh, uh, that's our transformation. And for this, um, um, let me now um, compare what this transformation gives. Like, let me now give you why this is useful. So let's start with XOR majority. We had already worked out parameters for XOR majority. The rational degree was L plus one by two. Uh, the K wise independence was L plus one and the degree was two L. Now let's see what happens in, the, in this predicate. So the rational degree actually just preserves. It's the same. K wise independence drop a little bit. It goes from L plus one to L. And there's a reason behind that. And I will uh, show that later. The degree from two L just drops down to L. And so what it does is that uh, if your maximum stretch was n to the L plus one by two minus delta using our intuition, uh, that does not change a lot. It just goes to n to the L by two minus delta, but the required stretch drops from n to the L by two to n to the L plus one by four. 
And then it gives a lot of room to uh, play with parameters in order to instantiate our assumption. So okay. you may have yeah. a probably sure. very dumb question, um, yeah. which is just, so you wrote equalities here everywhere. Are they literally equalities? Like no matter what the predicate is? No, I, I just said majority. For, it's just for majority. Oh, I see. Okay. okay. Yeah. yeah. In general, in, actually, I'll write down uh, what happens in general. Actually, it turns out that no matter what G you choose, the degree is uh, going to be precisely L and it's exactly going to be L-wise independent. I'll write down in just a minute. I see. Uh, like probably the worst case is like G is X or something or like, okay, sure, sure, cool. Yeah, it does not matter actually what G is for, uh, for K and D. Uh, only thing that changes is the rational degree. Rational degree is preserved in our transformation. Okay, so let me uh, now uh, follow up on Noah's question and understand what is exactly going on with this transformation. For that, we need to actually understand a little bit of Fourier representation. And the reason for that is that sometimes the things that are not evident uh, to naked eye becomes really crystal clear when you look at those same things in Fourier representation. So just to recall, uh, there are two ways of writing Boolean function. The first way is to write like this. Your Boolean function takes as input from 0, 1 to the L to 0, 1, 1. But there's another way. You can treat, uh, you can give, assign different meanings to inputs. So in traditional sense, uh, 0, 1 is your input, true and false. In Fourier sense, you can assign them to be 1 and minus 1. Okay, So 1 will stand for uh, 0, and, one, uh, and minus 1 will stand for 1. And the reason is 0 and 1 form additive group uh, in F2. 1 and minus 1 form multiplicative group uh, over the integers. Okay, So, um, so then you can denote your function like that. In the uh, standard setting, your uh, input variables are from 0, 1, and they are denoted by small xi. And you can write this polynomial as the polynomial of the real. This is known as the multilinear expansion. I told you about this, how to do that. In Fourier domain, um, this xi is going to capital xi, I will denote as the input. This is now in plus 1, minus 1. It, it's literally related like 1 minus 2 times small xi. So just a linear transform. And you can also write it as uh, the, the, the Fourier expansion as um, it's going to be some expansion. You can just write down the multilinear expansion for this polynomial. Now there are some very basic properties that are satisfied. First is that um, the, this output p hat is related with the small p, uh, with p of uh, x1 through xl for on applied on small inputs. N namely, it's just one minus two times that. And uh, second, one of the more important properties is that if you have XOR in the real, in the standard setting, sorry, X and X2, then it just becomes multiplication in the Fourier world. And uh, this is what I will call as the Fourier expansion of P, Fourier expansion. So that's all I need in order to be able to understand what's going on in the setting. So let's first look at uh, rational degree and see if you have a, an initial predicate like this and the final predicate like that, where the variables are used. Uh, sorry, okay, these variables are reused like it has some translation. I claim that the rational degree of this predicate is the same as the rational degree of P2. And roughly why this is happening is because there's a really nice uh, linear transformation between variables. Namely, you map X1 to X1, XL to XL. Um, and then um, XL plus one goes to XL plus one XR X1. XL plus two goes to XL plus two XR X2. X2L goes to X2L XR X1. So namely the, the bottom half is uh, literally transformed, uh, tra transformed as XL plus Y goes to XL X plus, sorry, XL plus I, XR XI, okay? Uh, whereas the top half uh, is unchanged. So this is an invertible linear transform. But uh, if you have any decomposition like that, P1, Q equal to R, where uh, these Q and R of degree E, then you can apply this transformation of variables and you'll get a decomposition of the other predicate, namely P2 times Q prime equal to R prime, where degree of Q prime and R prime are just uh, uh, the same as degree and Q of R, Q and R. So literally Q and Q prime and R prime are just transformation applied on this Q and R. So rational degree is preserved because of that. Uh, so, so far we have not used, of, uh, used any Fourier representation here, but this will become evident when I talk about uh, how, what happens to the degree uh, over the reals. So here, um, 
what I want to claim is that uh, this is your sorry sorry about that you have the this is your transformed predicate I claim that the degree of this is precisely L no matter what G you choose okay uh, and the reason for that is that um, you can write it as an Fourier transform you get P of G the XR becomes product so capital XI product I from 1 to L times the Fourier transform applied on the other function G now you can write uh, the Fourier expansion of uh, this function, which is going to be some polynomial like this. Remember the inputs that G takes uh, is an XOR of two things. So I'm going to uh, replace it with multiplications in the Fourier world. So XL plus one, XOR X1 becomes X1 times XL plus one, X2L, XOR XL becomes XL times X2L. And uh, then I'll write it as a sum. Uh, these are the coefficients and uh, this is the um, monomial corresponding to the set S. So uh, for every set, there'll be Xi and there'll be Xi plus L. Now remember uh, each Xi square is either plus one or minus one, uh, sorry, Xi is either plus one or minus one, so Xi square is one. So therefore uh, you can simplify this and take this thing inside and what you get is just a homogeneous degree L polynomial over the reals. And that's why uh, this has this we were going to have a degree of L, and uh, it's also be it will also be L wise independent. Roughly, um, this, not, this might not be clear, but uh, there's another way of stating K wise independent, which says that uh, a predicate is K wise independent. Let me write it down. Uh, P P is K wise independent if um, you can write P as uh, uh, in the Fourier transform, like one to i in s, sorry, xi, and then ps, where the size of the set is greater than or equal to k. So all uh, only coefficients that survive have degree more than uh, equal to k. So k wise independent means uh, if and only if. So that's why it's l wise independent, and that's it. That's our transformation. And uh, finally, so yeah, that completes that part, this part uh, of, our, uh, of my discussion over this PRG. Now let me talk about the third kind of category of attack and I will only briefly describe about it. So we work with the, we're talking about algebraic attacks on the joint assumptions and we follow in the same approach like the way uh, Albrecht et al and Chow et al did. So what we did was that we can write uh, these equations first equations are the ones that come from booleanity of the error second constructions uh, second uh, equations are from the prg relations namely you have been given some prg outputs and then we initialize uh, grobner basis systems to analyze this and the question is can you solve this to recover s and uh, based on our initial calculations uh, it seems that the grobner basis algorithms should also take some exponential time and uh, we are kind of using same inherent assumptions that were made in the initial works uh, to capitalize binary LWE. And this is something that Amit also talked about in his talk uh, in, in, in the Simon's workshop on obfuscation, uh, on uh, where there was a session on obfuscation. Okay, uh, so that is about algebraic attacks. And uh, roughly this table kind of summarizes the state of known attacks. Uh, so these are the algorithms that we consider SOS is only over the PRG, BKZ are lattice reductions, applying only to binary LWE, Grubner basis are uh, applied on both PRGs and uh, LWE, and then CDMLR represents the state of part alg algebraic uh, attacks on the PRG part. And uh, we instantiated these predicates, TSA, XOR, and uh, low degree major version of majority. Uh, we calculated what is, sorry, what is required uh, which looks like this and what are we actually getting using this uh, we actually calculated uh, back calculated values of um, epsilon and uh, rows uh, we set row to be epsilon by degree and uh, once we did that we found out running times and they behave uh, sub exponential in all these parameters in, in n sub exponential in n uh, and they are raised to the powers which are constant which are roughly like this um, does anyone have any questions about uh, any of the attacks or PRG constructions or this? 
Okay, so let me proceed. Uh, so uh, next, uh, unfortunately, I don't have too much time uh, about this, but let me now give you, talk to you a little bit about the new uh, proof technique that we've uh, constructed in order to get polynomial security proof. And uh, we call this, uh, uh, so, okay. So let me actually, our theorem actually generalized to, uh, applies to a lot of general things, but I'm going to give you one specific uh, um, use case where, uh, where we can apply this lemma. So here is the use case. So in typical FE schemes, if you consider, uh, for example, in uh, AJLMS and in JLMS and uh, other works, typically what you learn is uh, some group exponentiated to uh, some small error, where this error comes uh, is related to the some FHE ciphertext of the message that you want to hide. And this is typically smudged by some pseudo randomness generator, okay? Uh, and adversary gets to, gets to ask, let's say, some n to the one plus epsilon queries. Okay. Um, now, it turns out that if, for us to be able to recover the output, this error plus the PRG has to be bounded by polynomial. Otherwise, we won't be able to do this great log. And so, uh, this just puts a lot of pressure on our assumption because uh, this is only polynomially bigger than the error, and you can't. Um, you can information theoretically hide this. So the smudging lemmas that exist out there, they don't apply. In order uh, to handle this issue, these works typically uh, find a workaround by using security amplification. And this significantly blows up the quality of the assumption and also makes it very complex. So what our lemma proves is that if you, are, uh, if, uh, if you want to hide a message M and you are given FH encryptions of M, um, along with that, uh, you learn some bounded number, let's say n to the one plus epsilon, where n is the size of the ciphertext. Uh, you learn these EFIs for function FI, uh, smudged with an error which is only polynomially times bigger. So how how big? It's just uh, the number of queries times the bound of uh, each error times some security parameter. If you smudge it with only that quantity, which is still polynomial, that doesn't. Uh, and uh, 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 if you only smudge it with some polynomial bound noise. What we show is that this doesn't hurt security at all, and you can still argue that encryption of M0 is encryption is indistinguishable from encryption of M1. And uh, in order to do so, uh, and in fact, negligibly, we, we do not uh, make, we do, we do not, uh, in fact, we are able to show this, that these distributions are negligibly close. And in order to do so, we actually develop some new uh, techniques based on uh, ideas coming from hardness amplification literature. And so that's also really interesting because typically in LWE world, we, are, we make um, information theoretic arguments first and then a computational. Here, we are only making a computational argument in order to prove this result. And um, um, I think uh, I won't have time to cover the entire proof. So I think uh, I will call it uh, for the day, but if you have any questions or if you still want me to uh, cover it, uh, do let me know. Um, depending on the time. It'll take me around 10-15 10, minutes to do that. I think I usually can take 10 more minutes if you want. So we have 10 minutes. Okay, sounds good. So let me do the uh, kind of, okay, let's do a sketch of proof first and then we'll see. So, uh, so we are uh, learning uh, EF of FI, um, which is an FHE error, right? So uh, this is an FHE error, and we are learning, and then we are uh, we learn it with not directly. We learn it with something that gets added to it, and that's uh, and what's added is a smudging noise, which is let's say pol polynomially bigger. So e e i tilde is between zero to q times b times lambda, uh, and error e f i sits in between minus b and b. Okay, uh, and we learn it for how many values for q values. Now, I want you to look at uh, this distribution. So there are two ways of sampling from the same distribution, okay? So I'll uh, move on to the next page. Uh, actually, let me make a new, okay. Can you, everyone see this? Okay, so, um, so I want you to look at this distribution, EFI plus E tilde I. Now, um, 
this distribution, once you fix this EFI, is going to be uniform between EFI plus zero and EFI plus uh, QB lambda, okay? That's because once you fix EFI, then this is the thing. Now you can plot it on the number line. Um, zero QB lambda, um, and this is slightly disturbed EFI, and then EFI here, EFI plus QB lambda. Okay, now the, uh, the, really the thing is that you can equivalently sample this from a following distribution. Okay, so you find a, um, you find a, a canonical distribution. So that, that distribution is the following. So this is QB lambda. This is going to be uniform between um, B and here it will be QB lambda minus B. Now this, 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 this uh, interval is uh, definitely sitting inside this. So an equivalent way of sampling from this is that with probability um, QB lambda minus to be divided by QB lambda uh, sample from, uh, I will call it D. And with, uh, so I'll call, it, call this probability as P. And with probability one minus P, you sample from um, this uh, set EFI comma EFI plus QB lambda minus uh, P comma whatever, okay? This is equivalent. Now, uh, just think about it. Uh, so that means, uh, wait, let me align this. So I'm going to add one page. Wait, tag. Oh. Oh no, it's here. Okay, so what this means is that if you look at this probability, it's pretty large. It's uh, QB, it's uh, actually one minus two by Q lambda, uh, two by Q lambda, right? And now you're making Q queries. So in expectation, what's the, pro uh, how many of the, uh, the errors is going to lie outside uh, this interval of uh, D that I, that I told you? So in expectation, Uh, number of uh, samples outside uh, this interval D of uh, uh, B and QB lambda minus B. Um, this is uh, this, an expectation. This is this is something like uh, two over lambda. Okay, so this is the expectation, which is pretty small. And in fact, with probability. Uh, lambda to the with probability less uh, with probability something like one minus one by lambda to the c um, at most uh, c of them c uh, values will lie outside uh, d. Okay, so uh, this gives this this should already ring a bell that. Actually, the information that you learn is not actually that much. Uh, typically, in a, in a typical circumstance, you're going to learn uh, C uh, indices on which you, you're outside. And, uh, and then um, for that, those many uh, indices, you're going to learn approximately lo logarithm of uh, B plus QB lambda bits. Okay, so this is information theoretically that we learn. Now, I want you to uh, look at a lemma that in general, uh, uh, helps us to convert information theoretic arguments like this into a proof. And that lemma is this leakage simulation lemma that um, is, was proposed by JP14 and, uh, and it was also studied uh, later on. So what this uh, lemma says is that is take any arbitrary distribution from zero one to the n and let's say you have any function such that the length of that, uh, the output length of the function is bounded by L. So F, um, is some auxiliary information on X, then it says that um, 
take any x and any f applied on x this for every size of adversary that you want and any advantage epsilon uh, you can find a function that efficiently mimics f you can find a circuit that mimics f but it's much more efficient meaning that the size of f is only s epsilon to the minus 2 times 2 to the l so s is the uh, size of the adversary that you want to handle epsilon is the advantage uh, that you want to fool with and 2 to the l is just the uh, l is the length of the output that you want to simulate so what this says is that you can find a circuit such that this is s epsilon indistinguishable from x comma h of x but now h is small okay so what uh, so what it says it just gives you a way of converting something inefficient or information theoretically large to something which is efficient and uh, that's exactly what we do here um, via uh, some arguments um, and actually that i think that will require me some more uh, a lot uh, like quite a bit of time to formally nail down the arguments but i hope i am able to convey you the main idea and uh, i think the paper will be out fairly soon it's not out there on different and i will uh, then we will uh, try to push it uh, in a few days so you could uh, take a look uh, from there about the formal proof so with thank that very I much compute, yeah. uh, conclude and any questions first of all thank you very much ayush for the wonderful talk and people can unmute themselves and uh, sort of you know begin off pause and now if we are feel free to ask any questions now i think people can just unmute themselves and ask questions you don't need to type in the chat so okay. do that so just a quick clarification on my part yeah. just if i understand things yeah, sure. correctly the, the leakage uh, this leakage lemma that you were mentioning basically the lemma is saying that uh, you can approximate uh, a very inefficient function with an efficient function as long as you know the size of the circuit class that you want to be indistinguishable cool. with respect to yeah so if you know the adversary size uh, you can yeah. uh, mimic the inefficient function with something smaller uh, and that something smaller you can choose by uh, like you need to know what advantage you want to pull with and what's the length of the information that you want to mimic and so l the, is yeah. and in your work you are only working with polynomially time uh, polynomially bounded adversaries so i'm assuming that the size of the circuit that or the size s that you're picking here is something sub exponential for uh, exactly your, so for uh, fe uh, s is polynomial yeah uh, and epsilon is also polynomial for if you want to construct fe but still will, uh, when you set the so does this s appear only in the proof but when you do the sort of the setup of the entire system then it appears no only in the proof it doesn't okay uh, okay 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 so that's why it's basically it is more like a non uniform reduction exactly so uh, we 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 have an adversary and let's say it claims that i will fool i will break your scheme sure. with one by lambda to the c then i'm going to give you a reduction which shows that uh, he cannot break it with one by lambda to the c okay so that's just, how you argue negligible and just just one more clarification so the assumptions that you have hmm. are to, are the uh, how to put this i'm just wondering okay if this non uniformity appears in the proof does this non uniformity also sort of appears in some sense in one of the assumptions it doesn't seem to be the case right no uh, uh, wait um, you're you're asking if the assumptions uh, hold for non uniform adversaries so the the g l w e b assumption that you provided yeah. so i'm just wondering that assumption as you stated is just stated that okay hey for all polynomial time adversaries the advantage is negligible that's it right yeah exactly it's just a standard indistinguishability that and, you see in other words okay yeah thanks uh, so uh, if we, uh, do other people have any more questions yeah. and and you can uh, you can also feel free to reach out to me or any of the authors if you have any questions after the talk yeah awesome. okay so thanks very much ayush and thanks all of you for joining us today as well as for all the previous latter seminars so uh, so i think today is the last seminar uh, that we were running as part of the series and i hope uh, all of you were able to get something out of it and all the videos are already posted on almost all the videos are already posted on the simon's youtube page for all the seminars and no do you want to add anything to that 
Uh, no, just uh, thanks everyone. And I hope everyone, you know, takes care and does well. Yeah, that, that's more important. Sorry. Thank you, Noah. Yeah. That's a lot more important. <laughs> yeah, my bad. Uh, yeah. Thanks, everybody. Okay, take care. Bye-bye. Thanks, Ayush. Bye-bye. Oh, sorry, I have to stop the recording. <laughs> my bad. <laughs>